them up. We can pray for them. So glad they get to be a part of this communion time. It's very valuable. Yeah. Let's just stretch our hands out to them. We're just going to pray a blessing over them this morning. Father, we just thank you this morning for your children. We thank you, God, for the children of the house, that you will bless them this morning. God, that you would just take, Lord, the knowledge that they learn in class today, and they will turn it head knowledge into heart knowledge. God, we thank you for that this morning. You love each one of them, Lord. Place blessings on their life. We speak good things into their life, Lord. Identity, we speak that over them right now. Health and wholeness, we speak it over them right now. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know who their teacher is, so follow whoever. Right here, follow Rosie. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Don't you guys act like you're at a ball game? Clap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. Let's take a deep breath. He's here. Title of the message today is Don't Rush Your Yes. God has a yes for every one of you this morning. And he don't want you to rush that yes. I want to talk to you this morning before I even get into the message we have started a foundation class, and it's for you all to be a part of, um, because there's going to be some time in your walk with Jesus and the yes that he has for you that you're going to have to answer some questions. And sometimes these questions are going to be some hard questions that you've got to answer for people. People go through a lot of stuff, and the, the class is raising you up to be a disciple of Christ. And being a disciple of Christ, you need to answer things how Christ would answer things. You need to be able to step into a situation how he would step into a situation. And you need to be able to react to a situation how he would react to a situation. And so this morning, I encourage you to, if you commit to something, stay with it. Because when you step short of the yes that God has for you, you'll miss part of your testimony. Let me say that again. When you step short of the yes that God has for you, you'll miss part of your testimony. And your testimony might end on a negative note instead of the positive note that God has for you. The foundational classes are very, very important. How many of you have encountered someone in the highway or byway and they've asked you a question and it's been hard for you to answer? Or how many of you shied away from those things and you've like, I don't even want to partake in this. I don't even know how to answer you. I don't, I don't understand what you're saying to me. And you get frustrated. You might even answer them with a negative attitude towards that question they have for you. I mean, Donnie, if someone comes up to you on the street and you say, I'm a Christian, and they come up to you and they say, well, well, what about this? My wife left me. If God loves me, why? We have to know how to answer those kind of questions. Or if my child died, we have to know how to answer those kind of questions. If we're struggling financially, we have to be able to answer those kind of questions. If they're struggling with drugs, alcohol, we have to be able to answer those kind of questions. And coach them into the things that God has for them. Not condemn them, not take them down or tear them down or bring them into those things, but coach them into what God has for them. And that's what discipleship is about. 
we are all, that's, that's the main thing that Jesus wants for us, to love people and disciple people. We have to become disciples. In the world that we're living in, we have to become disciples. Do not rush your yes this morning. I feel like this morning there's a little bit of tension in the room, so we're going to pray and we're going to break that off before I get started. Um, anything that you brought in the house, any negativity you brought in the house, we're just going to give it to him right now. Any, any, any attitudes you have, we're just going to break them off right now. Um, if you're thinking about stress from the outside, what you're going through today when you get out of here, whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's give him this moment. Let's give him this time. And you can go back to that stuff if you want it. So, Father, we thank you right now. We break off right now. Every bit of tension, every bit of strife, every bit of conflict, we break it off right now in Jesus' name. Father, we give it all to you. The things that we carry on our shoulders are not for us, they're for you. You paid the price for it. We give it to you. You say our yoke is easy and our burden is light because you paid the price. So let us walk that out and walk in that, Lord. Let us cast our cares upon you because you care for us in everything that we go through. You love us more than we could ever imagine being loved. Some are learning and some don't even have any idea what that love looks like. Father, I ask this morning that you would just en engulf your sons and daughters with your love in a way that they would see it and understand the depth of your love, the depth of the price that you paid on Calvary for each one of us. So we glorify you. We give you all that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys feel better? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so good. So foundation class, um, if you don't know Randy, he's right here, the handsome guy in the second row, his beautiful wife beside him. Um, they are, they are co-teaching this class, and, um, well, she's, she's guiding him. You know, she's in there telling him what he needs to do. Because I heard what he said when she said, get in here. I, I could almost see that, Carlene. She's just so sweet walking around, you know. Carlene, just a sweetheart walking around. That I could see that side. Now. Um, my wife don't have a side like that, and I know yours don't either, but Carlene might. Literally, guys, though, the foundation class is good. If you plugged into it, if you signed up for it, commit to it, stay with it, stick it out. Because God has something for you. And you might, some information might, you might get it again. I tell you what, um, I've read this passage this morning. I'm reading uh, a million times and I'm still getting things out of it. Still getting things out of it. Still getting new things out of the passage I'm reading, the story that I'm going to talk to you about this morning. We're going to talk about Joseph this morning, a little bit about his story. And we're going to talk about your yes and how God has a yes for you. And we are not to rush the yes. God wants us to stay in tune with the yes and in, in where he wants. And I'm going to tell you, there's going to be times in the walk that you have with him, there's going to be times that you're going to get hurt. I'm just going to tell you right now, you're going to get hurt. People are going to hurt you. People are going to crush you. Some of the people you thought would never leave you will leave you. Okay? It's going to hurt. And you might lag back a little bit, but God says catch up. And he's saying right now, catch up to the yes. If you don't know your yes, find your yes. Catch up to where he's at with you and what he wants to do in and through you because your yes is so valuable. Don't get in front of the yes because if you get in front of the yes, he will. It, it, the Lord told me if I get in front of the yes, he'll crush me because the will he's rolling in front of me. He's crushing every obstacle, and I do not want to get in front of him, nor do I want to lag behind. And I have at times lagged behind. And he's like, come on, catch up, let's go, we got stuff to do. And there's times I want to just quit, just want to like, I don't, I'm not in the mood today to do it. And he's like, I don't care whether you're in the mood or not, I've called you to do this, let's go and let's get it done. And so I have to just keep going, and sometimes Shelly kicks me and, and uh, keeps me in line to go and keep moving forward in the yes to God. And I have to sometimes remind myself of the yes and what he's called me to do. I have to take myself back to the vision of all those people I saw in heaven that he said, these would not have made heaven if you would have chose heaven today. I take myself back to that place many times so I can keep myself fired up to move forward in the yes that he has for me. 
And he has a yes for you this morning. And I want you to know there's a story inside of your yes. There's such a massive story inside of your yes. Again, if you stop short of that story, it could end on a bad note. And we're going to talk about Joseph this morning. I mean, I, I'm, there's so much scripture. I'm, I don't even know if I'm going to read through it. Um, it's a story in, uh, starting in chapter 37 of Genesis. And the story uh, starts out, and I'll just read a little bit of it, in Genesis 37. We'll start out with in the mid part of verse 2. It says, Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was... with the sons of... This is, um, this is um, Israel's two wives. It's Bilha and Pilpha. I don't know where they got their names back then, if I even pronounced that right. Um, Steve, did I get it right? All right. I don't even know. <laughs> My reading is bad enough, let alone trying to pronounce some of these names. Um, I'll break that off right now in Jesus' name. Bilha and Zilpah, the father's wives. And Joseph brought... Um, um, <laughs> Joseph brought unto him his father their evil report. So Joseph would always come and he would always bring a report of what his brothers were doing. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure why he always brings the bad reports. I mean, did they do anything good? They, they come and report, but it just says that he always brought the bad report. And, and um, sometimes people are always going to bring the bad report on you, and they're never going to speak the good things on you. But Joseph, for some reason, he was always bring the bad reports that um, his brothers were doing out in the field grazing. I don't know what all they were getting into, but they were getting into some stuff. And he would always bring that bad report back to his father. And it says, now Israel loved Joseph. This is verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other children because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many collars. And when his brother saw that their father loved him more, they hated him. They couldn't even speak pleasant to him. Because they saw the favor that his father had on him. And I want to stop there and I want to say that God has favor on you and he wants to have that favor on you. And when you have that favor, people are not going to like that. They're going to see the favor on you and they're going to despise that favor. They're going to actually hate that favor because they're going to want it. And we have to show them how to live their life in a way that they receive the same favor that we get. Because everyone, God's not a respecter of persons, and everyone can have that same kind of favor in and on their life if they choose to live righteously and live right before him. And he made him a coat of many colors. A lot of times a coat um, or a garment would represent, it was a mark, a special mark of something, or it represented favor. You know, um, we talked last week about the prophets and how they would wear a different kind of attire. And, um, you know, it just pointed them out of who they were, like a law enforcement officer or like a doctor would today. They have a certain kind of a coat that they wear, and you automatically know what it was. But Joseph had this coat his father made him, and they automatically knew who he was, and they saw him coming from a distance. And we're going to see that in a minute. But Joseph was a dreamer. How many of you are dreamers? I don't mean like you're dreaming of things that you want to do in life, but a dreamer, like when you sleep, you dream dreams, and you wake up, and you're like, wow, what are these dreams? Some of you don't? Bro, you guys need to dream. It's good stuff. Sometimes it's not so good, but um, you dream, and then you write them down, then you get them interpreted, like you get someone to interpret. Uwe, you dream, don't you? Yeah. You interpret your own dreams, or you get someone to interpret them? You interpret your own dreams, and I do too. But I sometimes I have to call people and say, man, like, this is crazy. I dreamed this, and it's like way out there. But there's something in it that God has for us. And Joseph was a dreamer, and he dreamed these dreams that, these, uh, that his brothers were going to bow down and they were going to worship him. And, um, 
And they were out in the, it says that they were out in the fields, and um, and his and his they were binding the, the the wheat together, and his his stood straight up, and the other eleven the other eleven around him bowed down to him. So they're now at this point they're mocking him. They're saying, "Okay, so we're going to bow down to you, Joseph, our little brother, Joseph." And then he had another dream, and the father, in, in this dream, it said the sun and the moon and the and eleven of the stars bow down to him. Now his father's saying, okay, you and my mother, your mother and I am going to, and, and your son and brothers are going to bow down to you. And Joseph is just telling the dreams that he has, and I don't think that he understands the fullness of the dreams that he's dreaming, but he's speaking them out. And actually the brothers are saying, they're actually interpreting the dreams for him. If you look at the verse, because they're actually saying, we're going to bow down to you. Well, thank you for interpreting my dream, brothers, because they spoke it out and they actually interpreted the dream that was going to come to pass. And sometimes your dream, because you dream it today, doesn't mean it's going to come to pass tomorrow or the next day, or the next day, or the next day. It can be years and years and years before that dream come tr comes true. So write it down, put it on the shelf, put it in your book, because it's going to come true. If God gives you a dream, just like he gave you a yes, if you follow through with it, it's going to come to pass. Now listen. So Israel sent the boys out to the pasture, take the sheep. And they went to Shechem, and they went there, and they, they took the— so it'd be like it'd be like we have a bunch of sheep here in a parking lot, and there's nowhere for them to eat, so they take them somewhere where they can eat, and they took them out to a field that they can graze in. So that's why they went to a different place so they could find grass to, for the sheep to graze in. So it was different back then than it is now. If you had a herd of sheep now and you're running around, you couldn't just go to anybody's property and just let them graze. But back then it was different. You could just go and your sheep could go and wander and graze in different places. So the brothers had went out and um, dad come to Joseph and he said, listen, he said, I want you to go check on your brothers. And there's a key point here, and Joseph said, and Joseph said here, let me read it. Um, it's in verse 12. He went out to check on his brothers, or actually in verse 13. Israel said to Joseph, do not, do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem. Come, and I will send thee unto thee, um, to, and, and send thee unto them. And he said to him, here am I, meaning I am ready. I'll go. Whatever you want me to do, Dad, I'll do it. It reminds me of Isaiah 6, 8, 8, 6, 6, 8, where he says, um, where, where he says, here am I, send me. Let's see, is that Isaiah 6, 8? I want to get it right. Um, Isaiah 6, 8. He says, here am I, send me. He asked him, who shall I send? Who will go? Who shall I send? And he says, here am I, send me. And here Joseph is saying, here I am. I'm ready to go. We need to be ready in season, out of season to do whatever God's called us to do. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. We need to be ready to do whatever he wants us to do. However he wants us to follow through with this, yes, we need to be ready for that. There's going to be ups and downs. When you say yes to Jesus, it doesn't mean it's going to be all good and a smooth road and going to be a great ride. There's going to be ups and downs. And I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. Some of it's going to hurt, and so it's going to be some pretty, pretty hard lows. But you need to know that Jesus is with you through all of it. Sometimes we're going to go through some stuff, just like Joseph is going, going to go through some stuff. Sometimes we are going to go through some things, and we need to understand in those things to not give up, to not quit, to not get ahead, or to not stop short of what he has for you and I. If Joseph would have stopped short, it would have been devastating because his testimony wouldn't have rang on. And he wouldn't have been able to do what God has called him to do. So Joseph goes out, and I'm just going to talk to the rest of the story. And Joseph goes out, and he goes into the field. And um, as he's walking, there's, the Bible says there's a certain man that comes up to him. Now, of, 
of all things, Joseph is out looking for his brothers, trying to find out where they're grazing at. And there's a, just so happens to be a man that knows where they're going, shows up in front of him. I mean, what are the odds of that? It's not really odds. It's a God thing. God set this whole thing up. If you, if you read this story, God set this whole story up for his purpose, for his plan. For Joseph to walk out a, a yes, and that's what he did. So here he is, and, and the guy tells him where he, he's, the guy said, I overheard them. So he's, he's in the right place at the right time, and he overhears where they're going. So now he, he runs into the guy that's looking for him. And so this is not just circumstance. This is really God setting this whole thing up, setting the stage for this thing. So he hears him, and he's like, okay, well, we're, we're, I heard him say they were going to go over here. So he told him where they were going to go, and he, goes, and he goes that way and heads that way. And his brothers, you can imagine, I want you guys to get inside the story because you imagine the brothers are up here on the hill, and they're grazing with the sheep are grazing, and they see their brother coming off in a distance. And they recognize him because of the coat that he has on. They recognize him because of the favor that's on his life. And they see him, and they plot against him to kill him. That's how much they hated their brother because of the favor that was on his life. They plotted to kill him. And people want to kill you and your dreams and all that God has for you. They want to kill, steal, and destroy it through the enemy, the works of the enemy. And he works through people to do that. When they walk outside of identity, he works and maneuvers in their lives because of their open doors to come at you in ways that you should never have to be attacked, but people still attack you and still, people still come at you in ways that they shouldn't. But listen, so, so they're up here on the hill and they plot to kill their brother. I mean, who does that? Who wants to plot to kill their brother? Just chapters before we read it. Because of a man wanted to serve God, they wanted to give the right offering. The brother didn't want to give the correct offering, so he killed his other brother out of anger. So here we are again. They're plotting to kill the brother over this situation, over what's going on in, in, in his life, the favor that he has on his life. They're, they're plotting to kill him. There's been so many times in my walk with God that people have plotted against me. And I've had to walk through that, and I've had to just put it behind me and say, God, you have this. You have me. You know. So they went to throw him in a pit. They were going to leave him there. One of his brothers stood up and said, you know, guys, let's don't kill him. They threw him in a pit, and, they just, and he said, well, I'll, in his mind, he said, I'll come back later, and I'll get him. And I'll rescue him from that pit. And this band of slave, slave buyers and, and traders come, and, and they come, and they end up trading him off for silver, 20 pieces of silver. And they, instead of killing him, they went ahead and they said, well, this is our brother, flesh and blood. And, and I want you guys to read this story this week because it's so valuable. There's so much into it. And they said, well, we'll just, we'll just go ahead and sell him off. So they sold him off for 20 pieces of silver. And you would think for Joseph, like, this is like the low, low. I mean, all of a sudden he's going to tell his brothers to check on him. And then here he gets thrown into a pit. And then he gets traded. And then the next move that happens to him, he gets taken to Egypt and he gets sold to Pontifus. So now he's sold to this guy. He's sold to this guy named Pontifus, which is the captain of the guards. For Pharaoh, and he sold to him. So I mean, all these things. I mean, I would want to quit already. I would, I would just like want to quit at that point and be like, well, you know, I'm done. I'm done with all this. I'm done serving God. I'm done with everything because just kill me because all these circumstances are grave circumstances for him going from where he was, the favored son of his dad, to now he's in all these these scenarios. And so, but, but. Pontifus saw the favor that God had on him. So he was upon him. And Pontifus saw this. And so he put him in charge of his stuff, all of his stuff, so he would prosper. And he saw that Pontifus had, or he saw that Joseph had this favor in him and on him. So Pontifus ended up um, putting him in charge of everything. Then the story goes, and, and, and I'm telling you right now, there's going to be accusations made against you in your walk. Make sure that they're not true. And if they are true, make sure you clean them up. So now Joseph is overseer of all of Pontifus's 
material things. Then the wife of Pontifus thought, well, this guy is awful handsome. And she thought, well, I, I actually would like to be with him. And so she literally asked him to sleep with her. And he said, no, I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do what you want me to do. And to the point that she tried to hold on to him and make him do this to where he grabbed, she grabbed his coat. And, and when she grabbed his coat, he pulled himself out of his coat and ran out of there as fast as he could. Sometimes we're going to have to do that. We're going to have to run out of a situation. When we're in a situation, we just like pull and get ourselves out of it and run away from that situation as far as we can get. But then she lied upon him, and she said that he tried. She screamed and hollered, and, and the guards come in, and she said he tried to rape me. It didn't happen, but she spoke it, and because of who she was, the husband automatically believed what happened. Really, I don't know that he did, but because of who it happened to, he went ahead and, and threw He probably should have had him killed, but he threw him in prison. So now Joseph went from this scenario to this scenario to being favored, the favors on him, to being now accused of this, and now he's thrown into prison. And then you go, when he's in prison, now the, the, the prison guard saw the favor on Joseph, and with the favor that he saw on Joseph, he put him in charge of the king's prisoners. So now he's like a prison, now he's like the um, the trustee in the jail, if that's what you say, it's called a trustee in the jail, so you can trust him with the other people. So now he's a trustee in the jail because of the favor that was on his life. God never left him through any of this because he never left God. And he didn't stop short in any of these circumstances. He kept pressing forward, kept pressing on, kept the hope, kept the faith, kept walking forward. Then you have two, two characters that come into the story. It's the king's butler and the king's um, butler and, and um, say it. I say it loud because I can't hear. Yeah, the baker and the butler. So he comes in with the baker and the butler, <laughs> and they too have dreams. So we're all dreamers, and they too have dreams. And so they're, 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 they're in there, and they're, they have these dreams, and Joseph comes in in the morning, he sees them, and, and he sees the accountants on their face, and they look sad. So he's like, what's up, guys? And they're like, well, we had these dreams, and we don't have anybody in here to interpret the dreams for us. So he said, I'll interpret your dream. Tell me your dreams. And he told them the dreams. And then he interpreted. One of the dreams was the butler was going to be restored back to his right position and the baker was going to have his head cut off I mean I would hate to have been the baker right then it's like man that's a that's a horrible horrible translation of the dream brother thank you but like three days like yeah three days you're going to be restored and three days you're getting your head cut off and I don't know what he did that made him get his head cut off but um but that's that happened it's three days later they're both out of, out of jail, one with his head cut off and one restored back to his rightful place. But Joseph said to him, he said, listen, he said, when you go to Pharaoh, he said, remember me. Tell him that I was wrongly accused of this stuff. I, was, I didn't do all these things that were told that I did. And sometimes you're going to be wrongly accused of things. Just keep pressing forward. Keep moving forward. Sometimes accusations are going to be made against you. It's okay. Keep moving forward. It's part of it. It's part of your testimony. It's part of the overcoming. It's part of the walking it out. Joseph is walking this out. And so two more years, he's in prison. Finally, Pharaoh has a dream, a couple of dreams. And, and he gets all his valuable people in the kingdom to come interpret his dreams, and not one of them could interpret his dream. Then the butler finally remembers. He goes, wait, wait, wait. He goes, I should have told you this a long time ago, but, but there's a guy in prison, Joseph, who interpreted our dreams, and they both come to pass. I got my rightful place, and the other one got his head cut off. He said, he can interpret your dream. So he, he said, go get him. He went and got him out of the prison, cleaned him up, brought him before Pharaoh. Pharaoh shared the dreams that he had. So 
some of you are going to dream dreams to change a life or many lives or a city or a county or a state. But some of you are going to have dreams that are going to change the world. Just like Jessica Rose's song, it's going to change the world. I keep speaking out over her because we speak good things into people's lives. And so he dreams this dream and he interprets the dream of him. He talks about seven years of plentiful and then seven years of famine. And he comes up with this plan to build these storage bins to store the good seven years of good food so they could survive the other seven years of famine. And, 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 and Pharaoh thought that was such a good plan to the dreams that he had, thought that was such a good plan that he put him second in command to Pharaoh himself. Now look at this. If he would have stopped at the prison and just quit, his story would have ended there. Would have stopped at the accusation and just gave up, the story would have ended there. The story didn't end there. The story ends with, it's so much more than this, but right now the story ends with him being second in command. Now he could have went back and got even with every one of those people that wronged him. He could have just like the woman that accused him. He could have just like had her head taken off. Pontifus, he could have had his head taken off. That's how much power he has now. Never once did he go after them. Never once did he go after the character even of the people that wronged him. Because of the favor of God. Because he lived in the favor of God. He lived in what God had for him. The Bible doesn't tell us that he went to tell his brothers and get even with his brothers or even connect with his father. You ever wondered why? I mean, if you're kind of in that kind of power and you've been stripped away from your father and you've been away for that many years, 30-something years, you've been away from your dad that long, wouldn't you have th thought, well, I'm going to go see my dad. I'm going to go get a caravan. I'm going to go see my dad. No, because the story would would end differently. The story needed to happen because the dream needed to be fulfilled. And the fulfilling of the dream was the brothers bowing down to him. How many of you read this full story? If you haven't read the story, I want you to finish the story because the story don't end there. So much greater. But I want you to know this morning that your dreams will come true. If you follow through with the yes that God has for you this morning, you have a yes. If you haven't started walking that yes out, find out where your yes is and where you, where you need to start walking it out. If you have dreams, get them interpreted. Ask the Lord what they are. Ask him what they mean. Because in this circumstance, the dreams that Joseph had in this circumstance were mighty. And it not, they not only reconciled a family, but it, they fed the world. Literally, people from all over the world came to get food from Egypt. Because of one man walking out a yes Enduring all the hardships, the ups and downs of a yes. Continuing to stay with it, stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. End up being second in command. Never turned on anybody, condemned anybody, tore anybody down in the midst of it. Kept his character, kept his value, and fed the world. That's one yes. Yes. And that was just a yes to his father saying, go check on your brothers. You have a yes to our father in heaven that he wants for you. It's powerful. We have to get inside of the yes that he has for us and to not stop short of the yes that he has for us.
Let's stand. That might not be for everybody this morning. The message might not have hit everybody, but I know it hit somebody this morning. I hit center with somebody. You've been beat down. You've been torn down. You've been thrown down. You've been drugged through the mud, through the clay. Your name has been stripped and ripped. Keep pressing in. Keep moving on. Keep fighting the fight. Even though it hurts sometimes, keep fighting the fight. Your yes is valuable. And sometimes we're going to go through these trials and tribulations just to see how far we'll take our yes out. How, if God can trust us with the more, he'll give you some stuff, and he wants to see if he can trust you with more and trust you with more. When you give to him, he wants to give you more and give you more and give you more. I remember when I was a teenager, I remember when I was doing drugs and I was running through the streets spray painting the back of barns and doing stupid stuff. I repented of all that. God saw that repentive heart and he said, son, I have something for you. And that's what we're doing. We're walking my yes out right now. You guys are here being a part of my yes. Shelly's Yes. I want to be inside of your yes as well. I want to be a part of your yes. You get to be the big character in your yes. I just want to be a part of it. Help you along and let God show you what he wants for you. Let's bow our heads. Father, you know the yes for everyone you have here. You know the value that each one has this morning. I praise you, Father, for the answer to their yes. I praise you for the positive outcome of their yes, that they end on the positive note and not the negative note, Lord, because you don't have that negative note for us to end on. I thank you, God, that you're with us through the yes through the good times and through the bad times, you're with us. I thank you for being our front guard and our rear guard. Thank you, Lord, for setting your angels about us, protecting us. Thank you, Father, for your sons and daughters here this morning. In Jesus' name. Guys, I'm so thankful that I said yes to him. I'm so thankful that I gave my life to Christ. I don't want anything else. I don't want anything else in my life. Nothing else matters to me. He is all that matters to me. So if you don't know Jesus this morning, I don't mean know him like Satan knows him because Satan knows him because he talks with him. I mean, if you don't know Jesus in your heart, if you haven't repented of your sins and cleansed yourself and made things right in your heart, I'm going to ask you to come and pray this morning so we can pray with you. your opportunity this morning. Don't be afraid of it. Step out in faith. No one's going to touch you. No one's going to be there for you. If your life is on a negative note right now and you're not walking in a yes, you probably need to have an encounter with Jesus. He wants to encounter you this morning. He wants to show you something.
Listen. If you backed up this morning, put it in forward gear and come forward. I don't always linger long, but I feel like this morning I want to linger just for a minute. We're a little bit early. I remember I was at a preaching at a youth camp one time and did an altar call. After the altar call, the Lord said, do an altar call. <laughs> because the first group was just a group that come up, just to come up. And the second group was a group that really needed. There was one man that stood out that didn't come up. And, and, and I thought, there's something there. And I just, I just asked the Lord about it. And he come to me after church and he said, I'm a pastor of this church. And he said, I'm, I was put in that position. He said, I don't, I don't even have a Jesus in my heart. So I got to pray for him. We literally, literally don't know what's on the outside of the door when we leave here today. And I don't want to scare anybody into coming to Christ, but I want you to know that we just don't know. We don't know. My nephew, when he fell off the 10-story parking garage, he didn't know that day that he was going to fall to his death. At 19 years old, he had no idea. My brother, when he was 16 years old and driving a car, didn't know that a drunk driver was going to hit him and kill him. He had no idea. You do not know what happens when you walk out this door. Someone will say one more time. If there's someone here that needs Jesus, that needs him in your life, come and let's pray. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm not going to go to heaven and he say, why didn't you linger when I asked you to? That's all it's for. Why didn't you linger? Okay, let's just uh, let's stay here a moment. Let's stay prayerful for a moment. Let's just pray for these ones up here because this is valuable. Heaven is rejoicing right now. Just over hearts digging deeper, wanting more, wanting to draw closer to Him. Just linger for another minute. And I'll raise my hand. When I raise my hand, you guys can mingle and do whatever. But let's just stay here for just a moment. 